Indonesia conference. My name is Sarah Willis and I'm the Acting Assistant Secretary of the Indonesia branch here in DFAT. Um, I'll just start by uh, doing a welcome to country and acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional land we meet and to pay our respects to elders past and present. Uh, today's session, which is our final for the conference, is going to be, well, it's entitled uh, Health, Human Capital and Gender, Trouble Behind and Trouble Ahead. Um, so I'll just start by um, introducing all of our speakers and giving you a bit of background and um, bio about them. And then um, we'll go through the program and then there'll be a Q&A session at the end of all of the presentations. Um, in that Q&A session, you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, there are two ways of doing that. The first is to use the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen, or the other is to raise the, the hand icon. Um, and we will finish with a short voluntary poll at the end of the Q&A session, which um, we encourage you to participate in just so that we can gauge um, your, your thoughts on the session and the conference as a whole. So I'll start by, as I said, um, just introducing our esteemed uh, panellists for today. Um, our welcoming remarks will be made by uh, Pak Ari Konkuro. Uh, Pak Ari is the rector of Ui in, uh, University in Indonesia. Um, he's previously served as the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Business. He has held several appointments, including at Brown University, the International Centre for the Study of East Asian Development Studies at ANU, and um, he's the most published economist in Indonesia. Um, our first session, which is on um, COVID-19 and the health challenges in addressing the non in, sorry in addressing non-communicable diseases, will have two speakers. Our first speaker will be uh, Pak Furman Witola. Uh, Pak Furman is a fellow at the Indonesia Project at the Crawford School here at ANU. He was previously the research director of the Survey Meter, and prior to this, he was a research economist at the World Bank. Our second speaker on that session will be uh, Ibu Riani Miranti. Uh, Ibu Riani is an associate professor at the National Centre for Social and Economic Modelling at the University of Canberra. Uh, she's worked on a range of different research projects, including for the USAID, UNESCO, and the OECD and the ADB. Uh, we'll then move on to our uh, next topic, which is the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic on human capital development. And in that session, um, we'll hear from Pak uh, Bude Rizzo Zudamo. Um, Pak Bude is a professor at the Ant Corden Department of Economics at the Crawford School and the Deputy Head of Poverty and Inequality Research Centre there at ANU as well. He's also previously uh, worked as the head of the ANU project. Our second speaker for that session will be Ibu um, Milda Irhame. Um, Ibu Milda is the Associate Director of Research at the Ibu Latif Jamil Poverty Action uh, Lab, which some of you may know as JPAL. She supervises all of the research projects there. Prior to joining JPAL, uh, Ibu Milder has worked with um, the International Labour Organization as an economist, as well as the World Bank. Um, our final session, which will be on deepening the multidimensional po poverty, the impacts of COVID-19 on vulnerable social groups. Um, there are two speakers. Our first, Ms. Mrs. Sharon Bazell. Um, Ms. Sharon is the Professor of Public Policy at the ANU. She is also the Director of Gender Equity and Diversity at the Crawford School. She's worked in Southeast Asia and the Pacific for more than 20 years uh, with a focus on Australia and Indonesia. 
Our second uh, speaker in that session is Miss Angie Bexley. Uh, Angie is a Senior Research Fellow at the Crawford School of Public Policy. She currently works on the ARC project, which is called Assessing Childhood Poverty in Indonesia. And then our, we will then have the um, Q&A, as I, as I mentioned. And then as this is our final session, we'll also have closing remarks, uh, which will be delivered by uh, Professor Helen Sullivan. Professor Sullivan is the director of the Crawford School she is a public policy research teacher and advisor. Um, Helen's scholarship explores changing the nature of state society relationships. Um, and she regularly appears in print, mainstream and online media. So we have a really great lineup and, and some uh, really interesting presentations with um, an opportunity for some uh, interesting Q and A at the end of those. So I'll start by um, asking if Pakari could uh, deliver our welcoming remarks. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, good morning uh, or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's very Honorable for me to give address to such important uh, event in this extraordinary uh, time. I will give my address, not uh, try to summarize everything. I think everything will be covered in the in the seminar. But I will give a personal reflection what has been going on in managing higher education in Indonesia, particularly in my position as a rector. So let me uh, start with uh, uh, my remark. Since the virus, uh, the virus outbreak, education institutions around the world have taken quick measures to prioritize the safety of their students and staff. Universities around the world, both in developed and developing country, have taken measures such as suspending face-to-face -face classes, closing their campuses, and switching to online learning. It was reported that as of April 6, 20. 20 tertiary education institutions are closed in 170 countries and communities and more than 220 million post-secondary students have ended their study or have their study disrupted due, due to COVID-19. In addition, students in higher education, particularly those planning to pursue their degree abroad, are particularly affected by the spread of COVID-19 as they are facing travel restrictions, social distancing, isolation, quarantine, campus, as well as border closure. Similar to university and other higher education institutions around the world, certain education institutions in Indonesia have taken quick action in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak by canceling classes and other campus activities, replacing the conventional face-to-face -face lectures with online lecture, canceling graduation ceremony on campus and replacing it with online graduation. As of March 14, 2020, nearly 20 universities in Indonesia have announced their campus closure, including Universitas Indonesia, Universitas Gajah Mada, Institute Technology Bandung, Universitas Hasanuddin, Institute Pertanian Bogor, and other. Meanwhile, the learning process at all school level from primary to secondary high school are also disrupted by COVID-19. Schools are closed and online learning was massively implemented in the run. On March 2020, the President of Republic Indonesia, in coordination with Ministry of Education and Culture, MOAC, had decided to nullify the national exam school level through the circular letter number four, 2020. Thus, thus, so this is uh, the first time, I think, uh, in my recollection in Indonesia that uh, particularly we don't have a national exam at all. 
So the completion of uh, completion of the study is determined by the schools, such as through accumulating student performance score from the report card, uh, grade, assignment, and other. On the same month, the MOEC had published regulation regarding how education will be done during the COVID-19 pandemic. Through the MOEC circular letter number 36962-2020, the MOEC has officially regulated that university located in areas where the coronavirus has been found will have to continue their student through online method. For April 2020, the MOEC survey had found that 94.73% of higher, higher education institutions had used online education. The Higher Education Directorate has given freedom for university to use any platform for online studying as long as university ensure that all students are able to access it. The Higher Education Directorate has also advocated the sharing of material or public lecture between university to improve access for other university. The MOEC survey had also found that about 70% of Indonesian university students were ready to study online through application. To facilitate the study, MOEC has created an online learning platform named SPADA, System Pembelajaran Daring or Online Study System, for universities that do not have their own online platform and form partnership with international companies such as Google and Kuiper, and also companies, mainly startups such as Ruang Guru, Zenius, Plus Pintar, etc., to help facilitate teachers, students, and recreate their teaching learning experience through online. The MOEC has also made policy to lower burden on students as creating partnership with cellular company for cheaper internet package through KIP, Kartu Indonesia Pintar Kuliah, and giving an extra semester for students that were supposed to be dropped out at the end of the semester. This is the challenge. Although positive and speedy action has been taken by the MOEC to facilitate studies for students amidst COVID-19 pandemic situation, Indonesia is still facing challenges in the education disruption due to COVID-19. These challenges involve lower quality of learning process in general and the risk of increase in educational ach achievement in equality between region and income group. This is really a challenge. I think that will access will increase uh, the what uh, you call in the title of the this uh, today uh, event as the the, uh, the past uh, trouble and the trouble ahead. As previously mentioned, as soon as COVID-19 was declared uh, as a pandemic by uh, WHO, universities and other education institutions instantly switch it, uh, switch their conventional face-to-face -face with online distance learning. As a result, online distance learning was massively implemented in an instant without prerequisite of the readiness in infrastructure. This is also a problem. In this case, in order to perform an effective online education, access to internet and the quality of internet connectivity and communication technology are the most fundamental requirement. Although the, surf the survey by MOEC found that about 70% of Indonesian students were ready to study online through application, but the latest data from 2019 still indicates that the percentage of internet is still widely unequal among regions in Indonesia, where the worst condition is seen for most regions in the eastern part of Indonesia. I will close my remark by stressing this is an extraordinary time. I think as economists, our uh, profession uh, required us to make the world less confusing. I think this day, even the best government got bewildered by the depth of the crisis. I think that that, that stresses the importance of uh, uh, today's seminar. I uh, will end my remark here. And again, thank you for inviting me. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Thanks so much, Park Curry, for those welcoming remarks. I'll now turn to our first speaker for the first session, uh, Park Firman. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Rianti Miranti, Rihanna Miranti from University of Canberra, who is here with me. So what we're going to present today is our work looking at the challenges uh, that uh, Indonesia faces in addressing non-communicable diseases during and in post-COVID-19 uh, era, whenever it, be, it may be. So, so COVID-19 pandemic is uh, first and foremost a health crisis. And while resources and efforts are currently allocated to stop the pandemic, the disruptions in the health service uh, uh, threaten to halt and reverse some of the progress that have been made in the health sector in the past decade. And although there's still a lot that we don't know about the disease, there has been mounting evidence that the susceptibility to be infected and the severity of COVID-19 is strongly relate, correlated with NCD and uh, NCD risk factors, as well as with age. And this highlights the high burden that NCDs place on the health system. Then, and there's direct and indirect effects of the pandemic that threaten to increase this burden even further. So because of that, we will argue that uh, in, in this uh, a paper that in the post-pandemic era, again, whenever it may be, uh, addressing NCD must be a key part in uh, any plan on health sector recovery. So uh, let me start by briefly with the uh, context. Uh, this is what we know uh, before the pandemic. In the past 20 years, uh, NCD took over as major contributors uh, to the burden of diseases in Indonesia. And in the process, uh, NCD and uh, it, their risk factors increasingly put a, a strain uh, on the financial sustainability of the university healthcare system. And in addition, in addition to the financial cost, uh, the economic cost of NCD in terms of labor supply loss uh, and productivity loss may be, uh, is li are likely to be very high. And at the same time, we still face persistent issues of uh, uh, other diseases, including other infectious diseases such as TB, uh, uh, malaria, and dengue. And all of the above are on top of the existing gaps in physical health infrastructure, health workforce, issues with inequities and governance. And again, these are challenges faced by Indonesian health system before the COVID-19 pandemic. So the rest of the, uh, the outline of the rest of this talk is as follows. So we, we are going to first stage, uh, set the stage to discuss the NCD challenges in Indonesia in terms of health outcomes and health system challenges. And then we're going to provide the framework of, uh, for analysis to look at the direct and immediate effects of COVID uh, pandemic on NCDs. And we're going to look at the number of direct and indirect channels, how the pandemic can affect NCDs in, and, and their medium and long-term effects. And finally, we are going to uh, uh, discuss our insight and some implication policy. So one uh, important caveat that for this, uh, for this presentation is that we're not going to offer magnitude of the effects due to data availability at this moment. And you can see our work as an exercise in stock taking on of what the likely effects on NCDs are. So let me now uh, uh, pass the stage to Mira. Thank you, Mas Firman, and thank you, ANU, for inviting me to participate in this important Indonesia update. So this slide shows the epidemiological transition as outlined by Mas Firman earlier. From health perspective, across time, there has been changes in the burden of disease measured in terms of disability adjusted life year or dailies. As you can see, the top three uh, diseases contributed to dailies in 1990 are tuberculosis, maternal neonatal burden, and cardiovascular diseases. While in 2017, all top three are from NCDs. So you can see here, uh, like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, and also on your present. So further, the contribution of NCDs to total daily has also increased from 52% in 2000 to 66% in 2017. 
And then this slide shows major risk factors affecting health me uh, status measured in percentage of total daily loss. There are two types of risk factors, non-modifiable risk or characteristics that cannot be changed by an individual environment, such as age, gender, or genetic, versus those who are, uh, which are modifiable, such as food, uh, poor diets, physical inactivity, smoking, and harmful alcohol use. The top three risk factors identified in these slides, like uh, poor diets, uh, physical inactivity, uh, sorry, a uh, risk factor of uh, dietary risk and smoking, are actually the modifiable risks. And then both uh, shows increasing uh, pattern across the years. And then WHO also see that still 20% of adults in Indonesia are not physically active. Discussing these risk factors, particularly our modifiable ones, are important in the context of policy implication that will be discussed later. So how are the NCDs and its risks distributed? This map shows the geographical variation in the prevalence of hypertension, just for an example. As you can see, there are regional clusters, uh, like in Java and Kalimantan here. Uh, the variation can be contributed to uh, not differences in ethnicity or culture, lifestyle across regions, in addition to health infrastructure and also disease environment. And then please note that access uh, a gap between what uh, measured uh, and also what we call as doctor diagnosed. So uh, not, this is more because then people actually do not go to doctor to have their hypertension uh, diagnosed. And then the geo geographical differences can also be shown by health capacity gaps. This chart shows regional disparity in terms of health service uh, provisions, which uh, covers the proportion of institutional delivery, uh, district, sub-district with sufficient number of GPs, uh, village with sufficient number of health posts, midwife sufficiency and health insurance ownership. These regional indicators are part of the Public Health Development Index, or PHDI, a composite index of 30 indicators capturing not only public health infrastructure and services, but also behavioral risk factors and health outcomes. As you can see from the chart, uh, Western provinces tended to have better health service uh, proficient scores compared to the Eastern regions. Nationally, health capacity gap is also shown by the BPJS data. Uh, like the ship, uh, the supply side shows that there is increment in terms of membership that has outpaced the increment in terms of the health uh, services and facilities. So, like for example, by July 2017, uh, 17, uh, 26 health facilities providers serve, uh, serving uh, around like 180 million total members. By three years later, in July 2020, you know the increase in the health facilities we have at uh, 27,000 uh, uh, serving more than 220 million total members. So then, uh, do social economic indicators correlate with NCDs? Uh, the international and Indonesian systematic literature review actually shows mixed evidence. For example, low SES group can have higher prevalence of unhealthy habits, such as you know, having a higher tobacco consumption and less fruits or vegetables uh, than those in high SES, while high SES group might be less physically active and consume more salt or processed food. And, uh, However, uh, socioeconomic status correlates with underdiagnosis or under uh, treatment of NCDs, as can be seen in figure below. If you look at the charts on the right, uh, we could see that underdiagnosis of hypertension is negatively correlated with education level and per capita expenditure. The more educated uh, and the higher per capita expenditure, the less likely individuals to be uh, underdiagnosed. So we have seen the health burden of NCDs uh, measured by dailies. Uh, now we are looking at the financial burden of the NCDs to BPJS uh, in covering its members. Uh, previous studies argued uh, that N uh, NCDs would possibly impose a burden uh, around the US uh, $5.8 billion uh, on the universal healthcare system by 2020. And this is actually without COVID. 
On the other hand, large fraction of the missing middle who are without BPJS coverage still need access to NCD service. Uh, these are roughly around half of all informal workers who earn too much to be eligible for the government subsidies, but they still have very little income. So they have to be self-funded, voluntary enrolled, which is challenging. Then, uh, then it, we may expect the out-of-pocket costs of NCDs will increase, particularly among those people. So we need also probably also like uh, think about mental health, which is actually part of NCDs. In Australia today is actually Are You Okay Day? I mean, like health annually on the second Thursday of September, dedicated to remind everyone that every day is the day to ask, Are you okay? Uh, this encourage people to connect and address in uh, mental health awareness. And then in the context of uh, Indonesia, uh, mental disorders are the seven most significant cause of disability uh, as of in 2016. Although uh, I mean, across the year, uh, it has been stable and contributed uh, to around 8% total NCD dailies uh, to in period 2000 and 2016. However, there are still a couple of challenges. And our previous studies shows a strong correlation between the socioeconomic characteristics of mental health. And for example, the, my previous research also found that uh, the nature of work will have significant impact on the mental health. Like particularly like, for example, if you have a working in a job strain, uh, have a low control, high demand job, and then have a job mismatch in terms of you know, a number of hours you work, it can have a significant negative impact on the reported mental health. I think drawing lesson from Australia, I guess in the context of COVID, when the nature of work has changed and been affected, we may expect the mental health contribution to total NCD dailies will increase. And uh, just you know, uh, briefly on, in regard to the NCDs management in Indonesia, it is organized under the Directorate of NCDs established uh, by uh, Minister of Health. Uh, so far, the focus is on the pre uh, prevention efforts that relies on community-based approach through Puskesmas and their networks. So we have POSBINDU or POSBINA Antrapadu, which serve as an early detection, monitoring and follow up people to, uh, with NCD uh, or risk factors, and also PROLANIS or Program Pengendalian Penyakit Kronis, uh, which is a chronic disease management program uh, this is first developed to address diabetes and hypertension uh, in uh, 2010 and accessible uh, initially only for civil servant military, but it has now been expanded, uh, expanded under GKN. And then in line with SDGs, uh, the effort also has been focusing on uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, but mm -hmm. also expanded to uh, mental health, yeah. lower prevalence of smoking. Yeah. And and uh, I will pass it on to Masfiman again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mira. Uh, so what we're going to show you now is we want to offer a framework on how the pandemic may affect NCD burdens in Indonesia. So we think of utilization of NCD services as a result of uh, demand for NCD uh, services and access. And provision of services is determined by the availability of health infrastructure and health, uh, availability of health workers. And the coverage on NCD is then determined by the utilization and provision of these services. Now, the pandemic affects uh, to the, the disruption affect the coverage of NCD health services and ultimately NCD outcomes through these channels. Some of the effects are uh, uh, direct and immediate. Some will be medium and have long-term effects. And obviously this is a simplification, abstracting away from things like governance and or even finance. And it's also important to note that there's a feedback loop, for example, from increase or decrease in NCD outcome to the demand for NCD services. So what we learned that, that after the onset of the pandemic, we can see the disruption of health services go through these different channels. For example, mobility restriction can affect both demand and supply side restricting people with NCD to seek care, as well as restricting health workers to provide service. And there's uh, also uh, uh, risk aversion or fear of contagion also affecting the demand and supply side. There's government mandated closure of health services uh, on the supply side, and there's also bottlenecks in uh, supply chain of equipment, drugs, and supplies. And we're also keeping in mind that the disruptions have not only affected NCD services, but other services as well. So uh, 
before we discuss it in direct channel, it's important to note how COVID-19 and uh, NCDs interact directly. There are a lot of uh, that we don't know about the disease, but one of the things that we become apparent is a strong correlation uh, between NCDs and uh, COVID-19. And in countries that... Uh, I'll wrap it up soon, Pak and thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll just ask you to wrap it up shortly. Just oh, okay. So, yeah, uh, yeah, so the, we, uh, the, there's a in, uh, interaction, a strong interaction between COVID-19 and risk factors. And we've seen that the disruptions around the world uh, uh, occur everywhere, not only in Indonesia, we've seen uh, also disruption, uh, the data is not available yet. There's a decline uh, in uh, uh, services in outpatient and inpatient clinic. And, and um, government has responded, but understand uh, 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 era. But uh, so we're going to do some, we need to go to this uh, intermediate demand channel that we're going to identify first through changes in uh, 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 risk factors through, uh, because people are getting poorer or lose their jobs, missing information, uh, insurance coverage, that's mobility restriction, you know, physical activity becoming more difficult. And there's also increasing evidence that, and this is important, recovered patients infected with COVID continue to have health issues. And this will create an a upsurge in NCDs in the future. So two, uh, several more things. So there's a issue in mental health disorders that affecting different group differently. And uh, there are uh, evidence around the world. And in Indonesia, there's uh, some evidence, although the, uh, it's still based on non-problematic sample, but this is, uh, again, it's, continue, it's going to be uh, an increase in uh, up, uh, upsurge of mental health problems. And on the supply set, uh, side impact, we, we know how the crisis has uh, deeply impacted the health workforce around the world, right? So in terms of uh, death, illness, death, and mental health, toll health and health workers. And why this is important, it, uh, we know uh, the health work will be depleted and uh, uh, increase, uh, and, and it takes time to recruit, retain, and new health workforce. So I'm, I'm wrapping up now. So, so, so what uh, the increase in burden of diseases from NCD will lead to a likely increase in claims for NCD in uh, both in JKN, but also increase in, uh, in terms of the burden for those who are outside, uh, who, are, who don't have uh, insurance coverage. Uh, COVID-19 does not treat everyone equally. Those who are already at risk to their social economies are uh, likely to be affected uh, more severely. And increase in economic cost of NCD in terms of labor supply and product loss are likely to be high. And there, you can actually think about, the, uh, uh, try to build a model uh, thinking about the economic burden of NCD. This uh, number just showed uh, the cases without COVID and done by Bloom and in 2015. So finally, so we think that, uh, so based on this, we think that recovery when it starts will entail difficult trade-offs, even within the health sector, because there, there are a lot of things that we need to deal with in terms of pandemic, uh, um, uh, child and maternity, uh, mater, uh, maternal health, and other uh, um, um, uh, issues in health uh, sector. So it's probably smart to focus on addressing market failures in terms of lack of information of information on the cost and benefit of health uh, related behavior, looking at the negative externalities of smoking. And to continue uh, on, uh, think there are cost effective public health communication on health promotion, addressing risk factors that are modifiable. And luckily, a lot of tools that require, uh, are required to fight the pandemic are similar to actually tools that are uh, designed to fight NCDs. So for example, uh, the community-based disease, uh, disease surveillance and management, uh, innovation in telemedicine, and the use of health worker database to deployment of health workers. These are all being used uh, to fight COVID, and these are actually the tools that you need in uh, addressing NCD. So, so I would, again, uh, we would like, again, to, to conclude that, that uh, any 
plan on health sector recovery post COVID need to uh, address NCD. Uh, NCD has to be the key part of any plan. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Pak Fuhrman, uh, Ibu Riani. I'm sorry to have to wrap you up. Uh, it's a very comprehensive presentation. I'm sure uh, there'll be plenty of uh, questions at the end. So now we're moving on to our second uh, topic, which is the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic on capital human development. And if I could pass to uh, uh, Pak Budai. Thank you. Fuhrman, can you stop sharing, please? Uh, it will be Bumilda that present the uh, uh, presentation. Okay, yeah. I'll share the screen first. Um, okay. All right. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, I will represent both myself and Professor Budi in presenting our study on the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic on human capital development. So just a little bit of background. Uh, by 20th August 2020, there were approximately 145,000 formally confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Indonesia and approximately 6,000 confirmed casualties. The true extent of this pandemic, however, is unclear as the number of COVID-19 tests is still quite low. An outbreak of this size has enormous impacts not only on the economy, but also on human capital development. As such, it's critical to have an accurate picture on the magnitude of the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia and try to understand its impact on human capital development, particularly on health and education. So the goals of this presentation are as follows. First is to provide an estimate on the magnitude of the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia in terms of number of infected cases and number of casualties. And second is to improve our understanding on how the pandemic affects human capital development. We're going to focus on health and educational outcomes. And lastly is to find evidence from the literature on how outbreaks affect human capital. So let me start first with the magnitude of uh, COVID-19. As we all know, at least up to 20 August 2020, number of COVID-19 tests in Indonesia was still quite low at four per 1,000 people. This number is lower than many developing countries. As comparison, the total number of tests in Bangladesh is at around eight per thousand population, and in Philippines, it uh, was at around 19 per thousand population. Given the low rate of tests in Indonesia, we are unable to capture the true magnitude of the COVID-19 cases in Indonesia. Thus, uh, some prediction is needed. So how did we do our estimation? We base our estimation on the observation that if we control for country characteristics, there is a strong correlation between the number of tests to the total cases as shown by the graph. Thus, using a modified dose response model, we aim to estimate the magnitude of COVID-19 outbreak using a daily observation on total cases, deaths, and tests in approximately 100 countries from the period of 1st January to 24th of August. Specifically, we hypothesize, as shown by this equation, that the total number of infected person in country I at date T is defined as a function of number of tests in country I at date T plus the country characteristics, which include, among others, population and GDP per capita. The aim of this estimation is to get the estimate elasticity of a person being infected per testing, which is coefficient D here, that will be used to predict the true magnitude of COVID-19 outbreak in Indonesia. For prediction, we apply this elasticity number for the case of Indonesia using the data for August 20th, 2020 as a benchmark to estimate the magnitude of infected cases and deaths under several testing assumptions. So uh, what is the result? So the graph shows the result of the prediction, the difference between the orange and the blue line. The blue line does not include uh, control variables, while the orange line include the control variables. Let's focus first on the first dash line here, denoting the estimates. If we assume that the number of tests 
per thousand people in Indonesia by August 20th of last month, let me repeat, by August 20th of last month, were 20 per thousand people, which, is, which was almost equivalent to testing rate in India, Brazil, and the Philippines. Assuming this testing rate, we would have detected infected cases for August 20th in Indonesia in the range of 250,000 cases here in blue line or 400,000 cases here in orange line. If we compare this estimated number for Indonesia with the actual number of infected cases for India, Brazil, and the Philippines, as shown here, the estimated number for Indonesia appears to be quite reasonable. The second dash line denotes the estimates if we assume that the number of tests were 200 10 per thousand people also by August 20th of last month, which, which was equivalent to the testing rate of US and UK. Assuming this testing rate, we would have detected infected cases between 560,000 here or 1.8 million, which is around 0 0.2 to 0.7% of Indonesia's population. Similarly, these estimated numbers appear to be reasonable if we compare this with the actual infected cases for US and UK on August 20th, which is around 1.7 and 0.5% of their population respectively. It needs to be noted that the number is still growing, that it will double every approximately 40 days. This means, uh, according to the estimation, if the COVID-19 continue to spread, we will detect between 1.1 million to 3.6 million infected cases in 40 additional days from August 20th last month, if we assume testing rate equivalent to US and UK level. If you need more convincing about our estimation results, uh, in collaboration with Rose Anasrudin and Pian Amin of the University of Indonesia, a household phone survey of 342 households in Jakarta was conducted from 15 May till 20 June uh, 2020. The survey indicates that the percentage of Jakarta population very possibly infected by COVID-19 was 0.3% with a sample weight to 0.5% with sample weight by the end of June. As we can see, the result of the survey is quite close with the percentage number that we derive from est the estimation and thus affirming that the estimation results are quite reasonable. So we apply the same logic to the COVID uh, deaths and we get, uh, uh, we get the approximation uh, that we would have detected COVID-19 deaths number around 7 to 14 times of the formal number if we use the assumption that uh, by 20th August 2020, we had uh, the test number equal to US and UK level. Given the prediction results, the true magnitude of COVID-19 cases in Indonesia was probably more massive than the official number this can have dire impacts on human capital development. What is then the impact of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic to human capital development? In this section, we will provide a conceptual framework in the form of a diagram. As we all know, the most direct consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic is the surge in COVID-19 cases. Besides these direct consequences, COVID-19 also creates two indirect uh, immediate impact. First is limited mobility as government try to contain the spread of the virus. Uh, note that higher cases tend to push government to produce stricter limit to mobility. The second indirect impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is job loss as the economy struggles to keep up with the public health crisis. So these uh, immediate impacts uh, create a ripple effect and produce intermediate consequences. Let's start with the COVID-19 uh, case, uh, illness cases that will create intermediate impacts in terms of work absenteeism and family members' death that will feed directly to job loss, uh, exacerbating the problem of job loss. Increased COVID cases will also put a pressure in the health system, reducing uh, the quality of uh, the health system. If we move to limited mobility, the intermediate impacts reduce access, include reduced access to job opportunities, again will exacerbate the problem of job loss, uh, and limited mobility will also reduce access to basic health services and forcing education sector to adopt distance learning. Distance learning it itself will create another immediate impact in terms of digital gap and uh, unequal school capability in adopting distance learning. 
Lastly, job loss will reduce household budget that can exacerbate the problem of access to health services and digital gap. So the full conceptual framework is given by diagram here. I won't go into details, but as uh, can be seen, the impact of COVID-19 to human capital development involves both short-term and long-term health and educational outcomes, indicating that COVID-19 can have human capital development impact that goes beyond the pandemic period. Among the short-term uh, health outcomes, I would like to highlight uh, the uh, serious, uh, the possible serious impact on maternal and child performance and how it can be one of the important channel between the short-term health outcomes to long-term health outcomes. And I would like to highlight also uh, the impact of the short-term health impact to long-term educational outcomes in terms of educational attainment, employment, and income. So given that this study is conducted while the COVID-19 pandemic is still in full swing, we don't know yet the full impact of the COVID pandemic on human capital development. But COVID-19 is not the first disease outbreak in human history, thus we can take a leaf out of previous pandemic and epidemic. The next part will present evidence from disease outbreaks, COVID-19 and otherwise. In the interest of time, I will mostly breeze through this. So among the short-term health outcomes, I would like to highlight the mortality case from the 1918 influenza pandemic. Brown estimated uh, around 3%, uh, uh, the casualties for Java was around 3.9%. Barrow uh, estimated the global death rate of 1918 influenza pandemic uh, by 2.1%. Given the advance in modern medicine in the past 100 years, these numbers mostly are a ballpark for worst case scenarios. But this number still provides a warning for us to take the responses to the COVID-19 seriously. Next, uh, uh, following up from our framework, we want to highlight uh, about the, neg the possible negative impact of uh, COVID-19 to short-term maternal and child health performance. Uh, studies uh, from uh, the 2009 influenza pandemic and the 2013 until 16 Ebola epidemic shows a negative impact uh, of uh, both uh, disease outbreaks uh, to maternal uh, to maternal outcomes. So the impact on maternal and child health outcomes can be carried over to long-term health outcome as the research uh, on 1918 influenza pandemic by Alman and Mazumder shows that in utero exposure uh, exhibited impaired adulthood uh, health outcomes relative to non-exposed -expo cohorts uh, in the US. So similarly, for short-term educational outcomes, I would like to highlight specifically on learning uh, quality gaps. Uh, research by Smeru uh, shows that 30% of teachers in rural area were unable to use any digital uh, devices. Um, moreover, students from lower educated parents tend to use their study time playing uh, instead of studying. So uh, this learning quality differences is not exclusive to developing countries. A study in Denmark has shown, uh, I won't even try to pronounce uh, the name of the authors, <laughs> um, that shows that families with disadvantaged socioeconomic condition, particularly migrants in Denmark, have less access to digital libraries, uh, which is uh, educational support. Uh, similar with the uh, health outcomes. Uh, the short-term uh, educational outcomes can also be carried over to long-term educational outcomes, such as uh, such as a study by Allman that shows that the impact of the 1919 influenza pandemic shows that uh, the pandemic has caused around four until uh, uh, like students uh, the 1919 birth cohort. Uh, are less likely to complete high school compared to the cohort trend by four until five percent. Just flagging there's five minutes left in this session. Okay. So what all of this means for Indonesia? 
First, low level of COVID-19 tests most likely hide the true magnitude of the pandemic in Indonesia, as our estimation has shown that the true cases of pandemic may be four to 12 times larger than the official number if we assume the testing rate equivalent to US and UK. Similarly, with expected number of uh, uh, COVID-19 death, which is around seven to 14 times uh, the official number. And remember that these numbers are still growing as the COVID-19 spread is still ongoing. Literature has shown that these outbreaks can produce significant short and long-term health and education impacts, and thus it's important to better manage the pandemic as the, as the consequences is important, not only for the current condition, but also future human capital accumulation for the country. What is then the policy implication related to health and educational outcomes? In terms of health policy, there are three things that we can focus on. First and foremost, more testing, better testing, better tracing, and better treatment should be prioritized. Second, consistent and enforced rules of social distancing and regional containment need to be applied. If there is a lesson learned from the spike in COVID-19 cases after a long weekend last August in Indonesia, it should be this. Third, given the strain in the health system, faster disbursement of health budget and reforms to strengthen the public health system should be conducted. Lastly, in terms of education policy, COVID-19 stimulus must include funding to support the educational system. For example, by expanding scholarship program, developing infrastructure, or by piggybacking existing social protection program like PKH to include more education component. None of these policy are new and mostly are common sense. However, given this, uh, the, the uh, given the expected magnitude of COVID-19 in Indonesia, this policy needs to be reiterated and re-emphasized. Uh, in short, we need to remain vigilant until the end. So this actually will be the end of my presentation. However, because I would hate to leave the presentation on such a dry note after such a gloomy prediction on the magnitude of COVID-19. So let me end my presentation on a more uplifting mood with a snippet from a poem written by the Nobel laureate Amanda Corman. While we might feel small, separate, and all alone, our people have never been more closely tethered. The question isn't if we will weather this unknown, but how we will weather this unknown together. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me try to stop share. Uh, I'm trying. Uh, did I stop share or? Yes, you. you, you okay. You, All right. Sarah, are you on? Thank you. To yes, hi. Are we, you, are we hearing from um, Ibu Budia or uh, sorry, um, Pak Budia or no? So. I'm, I'm, I will be participate in in Q and A. Oh, okay. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thanks so much for those presentations, um, and really good to end on a positive note on, as you say, what is um, quite a a difficult topic. So we'll move on to the third session, uh, which is on deepening multi-dimensional poverty. What are the impacts of COVID nineteen on vulnerable social groups? And I'll ask if. Um, Sharon Bessel can start us off. Thanks, Sharon. Sarah, thanks so much to the organisers for the opportunity for, I think I'm still muted by the host. No, you're can, on. I'm on now. Thank you so much to the organisers um, for the opportunity to share some of our research um, with you today. And thank you to colleagues for those excellent presentations that preceded ours. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which um, we are speaking from, the Ngunnawal people. This is land that has never been ceded and to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. And my apologies, I've just got a slight 
delay with my um, PowerPoint. So we're going to be talking today about deepening multidimensional poverty. And again, my apologies, my screen has just frozen at this end. Um, Sarah, I've got a problem with my screen. I'm just going to close it down and see if I can start again. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks. Can I just check that everyone can now see the screen share? Yeah, it's on. The joys of Zoom. Oh, there we go. We've jumped to the next one. Okay, so we're all good now. So we're seeing from a range of sources and we've heard from the panellists today that incomes are declining and food insecurity is growing in Indonesia as a result of COVID-19. We know that these impacts are likely to be hit, to be hardest felt by households who are at the lower end of the expenditure distribution. And it will be, Bibi spoke yesterday about increases in poverty, especially amongst female headed households and those in the bottom 40%, and also the importance and challenges of targeting. We know from some of the data that are emerging that in Indonesia as elsewhere around the world, we're seeing gendered impacts of COVID-19. Women's income seem to be declining most rapidly. Domestic violence appears to be increasing and time burdens are greater due to greater caring responsibilities. In this presentation, we're drawing on the findings of a study that we took in 2018 on multidimensional poverty to ask how COVID-19 might impact on multidimensional poverty in Indonesia what the gendered impacts might be and which social groups are most vulnerable. I'll give an overview and then I'll hand to Angie Bexley um, to take over and to, to give you a little bit more detail about our findings and the possible implications. So the research that uh, we're drawing on began in uh, 2009 when we undertook research in a number of countries, including Indonesia, to develop a new approach to measuring poverty that's multidimensional and gender sensitive. The findings that I'm talking about today came from an individual deprivation measure study that we undertook in 2018 um, with the support of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And we are now taking this research under a new name, the Individual Measure of Multidimensional Poverty. So in this approach, we measure across 14 dimensions. Now, these dimensions in themselves do not necessarily cause are not necessarily caused by and do not necessarily represent poverty. But when they interact, when these dimensions interact, we see multidimensional poverty occurring. And from this approach of, um, of understanding deeply the impacts of multidimensional poverty on individuals rather than on households, we gain a very rich picture of the way in which poverty is playing out and we gain information that's particularly valuable now as we try to identify both the gendered impacts of COVID-19, but also which social groups are likely to be most impacted. The study that we undertook in Indonesia, as I said, took place in 2018, and it was in South Sulawesi in two districts with over 5,600 individuals. As I mentioned, a key feature of this measure is that it measures at the individual level rather than the household. So this means that we're able to identify which social groups are poorest and in which dimensions. We surveyed over 2,100 households and interviewed all members of the household over the age of 16. Um, the data were collected by the amazing team at SurveyMeter. Overall, we found that pre-COVID-19, women are more likely to be multidimensional poor than men, with more women than men in our study in the bottom three quartiles of our sample. But we also found significant differences between women and men across the dimensions and at indicator level. 
These differences often reflect gendered roles and responsibilities that are likely to be exacerbated in the context of COVID-19. What I'm just sharing with you very briefly on the screen now is the distribution of men and women within each of the 14 dimensions. We use a four level scale and because we're interested in poverty, the bar is set very low. Those who are in the least deprived category may experience some level of hardship, but we don't, defini we don't differenti differentiate within this broad category. Those in the deprived, somewhat deprived and most deprived categories are experiencing very significant multidimensional poverty. And those who are in the most deprived category are in real trouble. More women than men were in the most deprived category in eight of the 14 dimensions. And we can talk more about this in the question time if people have specific questions. The dimension level does tell us something that's important. And it is the groups, as I said, who are in the bottom three categories that we're most concerned about. But if we look at each dimension in food, we see that more women are in the bottom three categories than men. And when we drill down, drill, but when we drill down further than this, we see important gender differences. Men were more likely to miss meals during the day, likely because they're at work. Women were more likely to choose to limit the range of foods that they eat and to experience anxiety about food shortages, reflecting women's responsibility for ensuring that their families are fed. As food insecurity increases in a context of COVID-19, it's likely that the issues facing women in this dimension will deepen even further. Time use was the dimension where we see the greatest gendered disparities, with women far more deprived than men. Women's long hours, unpaid domestic and care responsibilities, and multitasking due to care of children is considerable. And this is of particular concern in the context of COVID-19, where we are seeing women's time burdens increasing further. And so we're likely to see significant deepening of women's deprivation in regard to time use. And of course, that has flow on for a range of other aspects of life. What I wanted to share with you here is what we see in relation to the sanitation dimension. And what's striking here is the bifurcation with the high proportion in the most deprived category. category. And uh, here we need to be really concerned in the context of COVID-19. If we drill down even further into this dimension, we have a theme within this dimension on hand washing. And what this theme within the dimension on sanitation measures is whether or not people have access to water and soap for hand washing. What we see here are the stark differences between rural and urban areas, particularly in that most deprived category. So what we're getting a sense of here is the challenges facing people in following even the most basic advice around how to stay safe from COVID-19. Accompanying the survey, we also took a, a quality follow-up study that was led by Clara Siagian um, and a team of local researchers, where we used interviews to understand people's experiences of participating in the survey, but also asked about violence, which is a dimension that we aim to measure, but is very difficult to measure for a range of reasons that I can discuss later. The follow-up study found a couple of things that are particularly important in the context of COVID-19. And they're especially important when we have other evidence that's suggesting increases in domestic violence. First, people experiencing violence in any form spoke of the deep isolation that they faced and talked about keeping their experiences secret, keeping them hidden from others. Second, we found that there were very few supports and services available to people, particularly those experiencing domestic violence and particularly in rural and remote areas. Strikingly, social supports as well as formal services were often absent. So we found that poverty is clearly gendered with slightly more women who are multidimensionally poor, but we found that both women and men experience poverty although often in different ways. In the context of COVID-19, 
Dimensions in which women are deprived are especially likely to be impacted. Time use, anxiety due to food insecurity, stress on social relationships and heightened dependency on others are likely to worsen. We need to carefully watch the impact on declining incomes and on the affordability of contraception. We need to watch carefully on the impacts on access to education, particularly for girls and young women, as the gains of recent decades could be lost. We also need to watch for the impacts on young men where incomes fall and household or individual expenditure is reduced. And we need to be concerned about the broader budget constraints on the quality of education. And I've not spoken about this today, but our study found very serious challenges in the quality of education. In the context of COVID-19, the low levels of sanitation, particularly access to hand washing facilities, is a serious concern in rural areas. But to understand more deeply which social groups are most vulnerable to the shocks caused by COVID-19, Angie's now going to take us deeper into our descriptive analysis at indicator level and particularly look at the impacts on older people or on people of different age groups and people living with a disability. Thanks, Sharon. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. So Sharon has provided you with a picture at the dimension level. Now I'm going to share with you some of the findings that we found at the micro indicator level. This is just a snapshot from some of our 1,200 tables of data we have available in each of our reports where we discuss the intersections of gender and location, um, uh, urban, rural, mountains, lowlands and the islands. But today I'm just going to focus on the intersections of gender and disability and gender and age. The end of the presentation, I will point you to where you can find a whole host of these resources. So starting um, with disability. People with disability are often the invisible group in poverty assessments. Where data is available, it is often not sex disaggregated. Indonesia is comparatively rich when it comes to data on poverty. For example, we know that prior to COVID-19, people with disability had lower monthly expenditure per capita lower educational attainment, fewer economic opportunities and reduced access to services. The IDM aims to provide additional information and complementary information to this existing data that Indonesia already has by providing nuanced and sex disaggregated data on multidimensional poverty beyond income and services. So our survey tool used the Washington Group short set questions to identify people at risk of participation restrictions and it was these people who were included in the study. This study that I'm going to refer to today does come with a caveat, it's um, quite uh, small numbers, relatively small numbers. This includes around, uh, it, it includes 306 people with disability. So although we have a caveat there, we can see clearly patterns emerging that certainly warrants a more in-depth look at what is going on for people with disability in this space. The main striking finding we found from the, our study across all of the indicators in each of these 14 dimensions measured is that people with disability are more deprived than those without disability. I'm going to take you through some of the findings at the indicator level in time use, work and food and look at some of the gender differences between men and women with disability. So starting with work, from the indicator level data, we can see that prior to COVID-19, women and men with disability were working long hours and experiencing heavy time burdens. People with disability are working just as much, if not more, than people without disability. So starting with the graph on the left, um, I hope it's your left, um, shows that people with disability are doing more unpaid domestic work and care. 31.7% of people with disability compared to uh, just over 25% of people with no disability. The second graph shows the percentage of time people worked with a child in their care. So people with disability are more represented here than those without. The third graph um, shows that people with disability are slightly more represented um, in the informal sector. And this is particularly re relevant given the people in the informal sector have been deeply affected by the current economic crisis. The last graph there shows the typical paid work hours. And so this is, um, while 
less women with disability are in paid employment. When they are, they typically work half an hour longer than women with no disability. So we can see there women with disability working six hours in paid work, women with no disability working five and a half hours. When we drill down on indicators in work and time use, this is where we start to see gender differences between women and men with disability. Our data showed here at the indicator level within the home that women with disability reported significant hours of unpaid work and care, and that women with disability were more than twice as likely as men with disability to report experiencing injury, illness, or mental harm related to unpaid domestic work and care. So the picture here prior to COVID-19 is of people with disability making significant contribution through paid work and women with disability contributing greatly through unpaid domestic work and care and also being vulnerable to harm in these contexts. What's really worrying is when we look at, um, so despite these levels of contribution in paid and unpaid work, our data shows at the indicator level that people with disability were more likely to experience food insecurity across these eight variables um, that we measured here. The survey used the food insecurity experience scale or the fee scale from the FAO. We can see here that women with disability were more deprived than men with disability on six of the variables and men, as Sharon had described, men with disability follow, um, follow that pattern of working outside of the home and having different approaches. COVID-19 presents particular risks to people with disability, not only in terms of health impacts, but also in accessing healthcare. Our data reveal the poor health status of people with disability prior to COVID-19 with worse mental health, with higher levels of worry, anxiety and nervousness. People with dis disability were more likely than those without to have sought medical care during the last 12 months. So higher access, but also likely to report more problems with the nature and the quality of healthcare services. For example, women with disability were more likely than any other population group to report not being treated with respect by medical staff. Looking at, at our data at the micro indicator level then shows the ways in which different deprivations can come together to create and compound effects of multidimensional poverty. What we have learned about people with disability raises serious warnings about the likely impacts of people with disability as paid employment decreases, unpaid work particularly for women increases, and food becomes less affordable as incomes fall. This and combined with the lack of quality medical care and stigma experienced by people with disability has led disability advocacy groups in Indonesia during the current context of COVID-19 to voice their concern that people with disability are intentionally giving lo given lowest priority for medical care and often with dire outcomes. As gender and disability shape the nature of poverty experienced by individuals, so too does age, with age and gender intersecting to provide gendered and generational patterns of poverty. Here I wanted to just quickly draw your attention to our data that shows how these three age groups experience multidimensional poverty and how the context of COVID-19 exacerbates the pre-existing deprivations. Young people in particular were characterised by indicators on poor mental health, higher rates of anxiety, worry and nervousness, and this is now overlaid by the high levels of unemployment, um, as Chris Manning was telling us also about yesterday. For people in the middle age, as Sharon also pointed out, particularly women, our data shows they have heavy time burdens of unpaid work and care. This has now increased during COVID-19 and puts women in particular at risk in context of domestic violence. For the elderly, we saw how uh, in the domain of social relationships, defined by the capacity for reciprocity, which can act as a buffer, were poor. And in the context of socialisation, of social isolation, these trends will be exacerbated. So to conclude, in launching the Global Humanitarian Response Plan for COVID-19 for the UN, the Secretary-General argued that this was the moment to step up for the vulnerable. 
but we can only do this if we can identify who are the most vulnerable and in what ways. This study in Indonesia reveals which social groups were experiencing multidimensional poverty prior to COVID-19, and these deprivations are likely to deepen now. If social protection measures in response to COVID-19 are to be effective, then nuanced information on the ways in which multidimensional poverty is impacting on different social groups is essential. For people living in multidimensional poverty, COVID-19 is just one of the many crises they must deal with on a daily basis. But without well-designed interventions, their poverty and precarity will deepen. What our data from the Indonesian country study shows us is that the individual level and gender sensitive information on multidimensional poverty is essential to complement existing data that we have in Indonesia in determining responses and ensuring that the most vulnerable groups are reached and protected. Thank you. And this link here um, directs you to our Indonesia page with a whole host of fantastic resources, including um, a number of Indonesian language animations. And for my final plug, um, we are officially launching the Individual Deprivation Measure Indonesia Country Study on Monday. Uh, this will be launched by Dr Maliki, Director of Poverty Alleviation and Development of Social Welfare in Bapenas, and will be facilitated by Nina Sujaniani, who is the um, head of the SDG Secretariat, and uh, Alastair Cox from the Australian Embassy in Jakarta will also be speaking. So please come and register for that event also. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, uh, Sharon and Angie. That actually concludes our presentations for today. So I'll just uh, start by thanking all of our presenters. Um, they've been incredibly informative and, and interesting. Um, so we will have our Q&A session now. Um, I just encourage everybody to uh, get your questions in. You can either do that, just a reminder again, uh, by your Q&A uh, box down the bottom, or you can put a raise a hand up on your Zoom function. So I'll take several rounds of questions and at once and direct them um, to our speakers and then come back for further rounds. Um, our first round, I'll take um, two questions, both of which I don't think are live, so I'll read those out. Um, our first question comes from uh, Andre Suranta. Andre asks, and this is directed to you, uh, Mas Firman and Miba Mira. Uh, they ask, Jakarta is going for full PSBB again come Monday because isolation beds are going to be full by 17 September 2020. On the other hand, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine trial, which is the most advanced, has encountered delays. I think we are focusing too much on finding a vaccine and neglecting the need for real broad-based healthcare reform. What are your thoughts? Is there any information on what the Indonesian government is doing to increase capacity? Sorry, that's a bit of a long one. Um, the second question um, for our first round, I'll read again because it's come from YouTube. Uh, it's come from Mashan. And that's to Sharon and Angie. Um, can you please advise how will COVID influence uh, female labour participation, especially related to the disruptive time use? So I'll hand to you, Mas Firman and uh, Mabmira, in the first place to answer question number one. Thank you. Well, uh, th thank you. Um, well, th thank you, Andrea. This is really a great uh, question. Um, uh, who knows that uh, when we present uh, this paper, we're still on this uh, uh, state, uh, this trajectory of the crisis. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that in, in time like this, in time of crisis, there's always this opportunity to uh, for a broad health reform. And that's why we think, and we think that uh, uh, any health reform uh, on the health sector have to incorporate N, uh, uh, NCDs. Uh, but uh, but there are other reforms that are possible as well. For uh, and we talk 
a little bit Mira did talk about the modifi modifiable uh, uh, risk factors and we, we can talk in particular about smoking there's a lot of opportunity at this time to actually do something on smoking that not necessarily involve only the, the uh, uh, health but other uh, 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 line industry as well uh, but in the meantime I, I, uh, I uh, well we're focusing on uh, finding vaccine and actually stopping the pandemic and and to and then i it's it's understandable right it's it's it's, it's quite justifiable that uh, that in the short uh, we, we're still deep in 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 the middle of the crisis uh, although uh it's outside the scope of our paper to evaluate this uh the the uh the uh, COVID, uh, uh mitigation um, there's a lot we uh, I think we agree there's a lot of uncertainties and on, on, on not, not clarity in the direction that we're going so that's uh, that is still uh, uh, that's definitely a concern so in terms of uh, um, increasing capacity uh, maybe Mira want to add something I just would like uh, thank you very much uh, for the questions I just would like probably to highlight again, you know, like our presentation, which is about, you know, there's disparities as well in terms of uh, regional uh, health capacity gaps. I guess that also probably can be, you know, like a, a, a focus of a government reform, maybe in the medium or the long term, because then even nationally also, like we can see from the, uh, you know, the data from uh, BPGS and then the increment in terms of the membership has outpaced the increments of, in terms of the health service of facility. So no, uh, maybe it's probably not now, but the, uh, it seems like all the resources probably goes to COVID, but I think it's a medium, the long term, I think, uh, uh, yeah, we agree that uh, it, this is really an opportunity to uh, really reform the, the whole uh, uh, health sector. Thank you. Great, and over to you, uh, Sharon or Angie, on question two. So that was the question on women's participation in the labour market, in the labour force? Yes, that's right. How will COVID influence female participation, especially re related to disruptive time use? So I think Chris Manning's presentation yesterday also gives us some really important insights into um, labour force participation for, for both women and men. And as Chris pointed out yesterday, particularly for younger people, I think what we're seeing from our data um, is the already very, very high um, time burdens on women prior to COVID-19. So it depends somewhat on the context, but if we do see lockdowns, particularly in relation to education for primary and secondary school children, then that will have greatest impacts on women. What we saw in our data was the extent to which women were responsible for childcare um, and the very low responsibility of men in terms of day-to-day -day care of children. And so if we do see distance education happening for younger children, then that's going to impact very, very significantly on women. Um, and that's perhaps where we'll see the greatest impacts on women's ability to um, engage in the labour force. We also see um, patterns of women caring more broadly. And so if we have the kinds of consequences for older people um, that we've seen in many parts of the world, then again, that's going to impact on women's time burdens and on their abilities to do anything other than caring. So I think, you know, as Fuhrman said, there are still many unknowns around this, but the patterns of time use that we see pre-COVID-19 um, give us some real warning flags in terms of the likely impact on women. Um, I'm not sure if Angie wants to add anything to that. Thanks, Sharon. All right, um, for our second round of questions, um, I'll cover three and then again hand over to our panellists. Our first question in this round is from Rusan uh, Nasruddin, and that's a live question. So I'll hand over to them to ask that now. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
my question uh, is directed to uh, Sharon and uh, Angie. Thank you so much for acknowledging the heterogeneous possible impact to uh, Indonesian subgroup of, of population, especially uh, based on gender and, and uh, social economic uh, limitation. Uh, in this regard, I would like to uh, raise a concern about the uh, territorial differences of uh, the COVID impact uh, across Indonesia. Uh, my concern is um, Indonesian social protection seems to apply a uniform benefit incident. Uh, for example, uh, the food transfer like uh, BPNT or PKH in which women allocate their budget uh, from it is uh, nationally uniform, but we we uh, seems to agree that the COVID impact might be uh, heterogeneous across the archipelago. Do you think that Indonesia need to consider uh, a different uh, benefit incidents to to handle this issue? Thank you. Thanks for that question, Rusan. Um, so the second question um, I'll read, it comes from DC Payne. And the question is for Bumilda or Park Woody. Um, your prediction model on number of cases is really interesting. Do you consider different types of implemented restriction policies, as well as the possibility of different degree of voluntarily of voluntary uh, restrictions? Uh, how do those factors, how could those factors affect the number of cases? And then our third question comes from Eliza Hunt, and that is live. So I'll hand over to you, Eliza, to ask that question. Thanks for that. Can you hear me now? Um, thank you all for fabulous presentations. I was really interested um, in all the presentations, but particularly I had a bit of a question for Sharon and Angie. I was just a bit keen to understand a little bit more about your disability measure. I see you've used the Washington Group's measure and you've dichotomised it in some way in terms of um, identifying disabled and non-disabled groups. Um, can you clarify exactly how you did that and maybe talk a little bit about whether or not some of your data covers the experience of um, persons with a mental illness um, who might be included under that disability group? Great, thanks Eliza. So I'll hand back to you, Sharon, first uh, to answer Rosan's question. Rosan, thank you. That's a fantastic question um, that really goes to the heart of, of how we can respond to COVID-19. Um, I might say a couple of things and then hand over to, to Angie to add to that. Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is, Rusan, you, you made the point about that there are territorial differences across Indonesia, and the data that we have from our study is from South Sulawesi. Um, so I think if we put it in the context of other evidence that we have, um, many of the findings that we have do apply elsewhere, but we do need some caution in assuming that the data that we have is necessarily applicable everywhere. But you asked the question um, about whether we need to differentiate or not in terms of approaches to social protection. And I think this is going to be a particularly important question um, as resources become increasingly constrained and the budget available to respond um, to COVID-19 is, is, um, is less, is de in decline. Um, and if we think about that context of constrained resources and greater need, then likely, yes, there is a need for some level of differentiation and to ensure that we are targeting in ways that actually reach those people who most need it. And so that means perhaps some differentiation in terms of geographic location. And I think Angie will say more about this in just a moment, um, but certainly in terms of which social groups um, are most likely to be impacted. And I think we also need to think about um, the needs of the groups that social protection measures are targeting. So if we take into account, for example, women's um, time burdens, then the delivery of any social protection programs in the context of COVID-19, where those, term, those time burdens will be exacerbated, 
need to ensure that they're not putting extra requirements on women or extra time burdens to comply with those measures. Um, so I think as we see more constraints around resources, we do need to think much more carefully um, about targeting, about how social protection is delivered and ensuring that we make the most of the budget that's available and reach those that are most impacted. And certainly in relation to disability, where we have some data, um, that's the group that's normally most hidden, um, but likely to be most in need. But I think Angie has some, some really interesting imp uh, information around geographic differences. So I'll hand to Angie. So we did two studies, um, one in Jenaponto and one in Pankat, Kabupaten um, Pankajane. And we were able to respond to local policy makers who were very interested in getting data across um, their geographical location. So they are one um, Kabupaten that has mountains, lowlands and the islands. And we can see really clearly in the data just how deprived and across most of the dimensions um, and indicators within those dimensions that people living in the islands are, particularly around issues of um, food, food insecurity, um, time use as well, um, sanitation was a big, big issue, much more um, clearly seen in the islands area. Um, you know, access to not only clean water for drinking, um, but also for domestic use. And so this study was able to really show with even within one kabupaten how people, certain groups are being deprived. Thank you, Angie. I'll um, now hand... Uh, Sorry, I've lost the question to uh, Boom Milda and Puck Budi um, to answer the question um, from DC Payne. Thank you. Um, let me try to uh, answer that question first. Uh, uh, yes, there is data on um, how this uh, policy is implemented, but in the model, we prefer to put uh, uh, to control only characteristic before the pandemic. And so, because the policies is actually could be determined by the situation, the number of uh, cases detected. Uh, and so there could be some reverse causality issue to be saved, then we do not uh, put that as, um, as, a, as a control, but all the control are characteristic before the pandemic in, in that sense that, uh, our uh, uh, test variable uh, could be uh, look as uh, relatively in exogenous. So yeah. So yeah. So so that is my uh, question. Meaning that if we put those variable, it could make our estimation bias. Thank you, Pak Budi. Anything to add from, uh, no? Okay, um, then Sharon, if we could hand back to you for Eliza's question. Sure, thanks so much for the question, Eliza. Um, I'm conscious that I'm talking to someone who is much more expert on disability in Indonesia than I am. So uh, this is something I'd love to talk to you more about. We use the Washington Group um, short set questions in the demographic section of the individual survey in order to identify people uh, with phys physical or cognitive disabilities. Um, now, we are conscious that this in many ways is um, not ideal, but those questions um, have been uh, well tested and validated internationally. And so they were, uh, we thought, the, the most appropriate questions to use to try to get some differentiation um, and to be able to understand whether people are living with a disability. People who answered those questions as not being able to um, do those, those things like dressing yourself, being able to walk, being able to climb, um, who could not do those things at all or had serious severe trouble in doing those things that are asked in the Washington Group question about day-to-day -day activities were classified um, for our purposes as having disability. 
As Angie mentioned, we have a fairly small proportion, about 406 people um, were identified as having disability. And so what we're seeing in our data is really, I guess, the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, we do ask questions about anxiety, depression, nervousness and worry in our health dimension. And that dimension is not used as a screening question in the way the Washington Group questions are, but we assess in that health dimension both physical health status um, and then so social psycho emotional health status. So we do capture in that dimension some issues around, um, as I said, nervousness, anxiety, depression. Um, and that's the data that Angie was referring to where we see that young people have particularly high levels of anxiety. Um, but the screening questions are from the Washington Group questions on both physical and cognitive disability. And Eliza, I saw in the chat that you'd also ask for that web address and we'll pop that into the chat now. Okay, great. Thanks very much. We've probably got another 15 minutes before um, we hand over to Professor Sullivan for the closing remarks. So we'll do another round. Um, the first question comes from Hasnini and Hasnini is live. So handing over to you, Hasnini, to ask your question. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, I have a question to uh, Ibu Sharon. Um, I really enjoy your presentation, Ibu Sharon. Uh, perhaps I have a couple of questions. The first one is that, uh, could you please uh, explain a little bit on the concept of water and hand wash practice that you use in your study? Is it like following the concept of the UN manual or, or the SDG? The second one is that, um, do you have uh, any thought on the, on the association between the, the spread of COVID-19 with the, with the statistics of water and hand wash? As what I found from the Susunas is that, uh, household living in a, in a rural areas tend to have a lower access to water and hand wash. And in line with that, do you have any, like some sort of like prediction, like the future prediction for those who are living in rural areas for household with lower access to water and hand wash sanitation, how do we, how will they, how will they infect, how will they be like infected by the coronavirus? And the third one, perhaps, um, um, my third question is that uh, I'm thinking, um, as it is now, the spread of COVID-19 is is tend to increase a bit faster. So, do you have any thought on how um, the local government, you know, like to how local government put some sort of like a specific uh, regulation, in particular on water and wash practice? Thank you. Thanks very much. Our second question is from Yogi Vidyatama, um, and that one is live also. So over to you, Yogi, to ask your question. Can you hear okay. us, Yogi? Oh, yes, yeah, so I can hear you. Please go ahead. Sorry. So basically, I uh, this is for all the panels. Uh, you maybe uh, one of you can uh, address this question. So basically, I would like to know how uh, your view on the ability of Indonesian community to adapt to the changing or the changing culture given to the COVID in terms of learning, working, engaging, socializing as well as uh, any other disruption in the future, whether they are uh, going to be willingly to change or uh, the basic culture in their heart are still uh, so thick and it is very hard for uh, Indonesian to change, uh, to adapt. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yogi. And our final question is from no Noviandri, and that is one that I'll read out. Um, they ask, now that we're aware of the COVID impact on human development in the short and long term, 
what do you think should be the priority for the education sector? Uh, we know that the government's policy response was quick and covers a lot of dimensions, and that includes school, schooling from home, uh, school financing, etc. But what more can be done to improve learning? Um, and that one has not been directed to anyone specifically. Um, so how about we start, um, Sharon, with the question that was directed to you first by Hasnan. Sure, thank you. I'm conscious that our sound quality isn't very good and we've just turned up the volume, so I'm hoping it's a little bit better now. Um, thanks for the question on water. So there are two relevant dimensions here in the, the measure that we have developed and we're using. There is a dimension on water, which is about access to water and clean water, uh, particularly for drinking and for cooking. Then we have a, a dimension on sanitation, and this is where we measure around um, access to toilets in the home, and if there isn't access to toilet facilities in the home, then where those toilet facilities are, whether they're shared or whether they're public facilities. Um, and within the sanitation dimension, a theme on hand washing, which is the theme um, that I mentioned in the presentation, which focuses on access to water for hand washing in the home, but then also focuses on soap, uh, availability of soap. And so in relation to the spread of COVID-19, it's that sanitation dimension that's particularly important because this is suggesting that there are a significant proportion of people, particularly in rural areas. And we found this, especially in the islands of Punkep, where a very high proportion of people didn't have access to water for hand washing in the home or access to soap. So that's, that's really significant in terms of the spread of COVID-19. Um, access to toilets, particularly, this was particularly an issue in um, rural areas, is also an issue in terms of the spread of COVID-19 because it means that people really can't self-isolate. You know, for the most fundamental requirements of going to the toilet or collecting water, then in rural areas particularly, people need to do that in order to survive. Um, and so for both hygiene practices and self-isolation in the context of COVID, this is really significant and has very worrying implications in terms of the spread. Um, and I'll just hand to Angie to talk a little about some of the local government implications. So I think um, we're seeing evidence. I mean, local governments have huge potential to be able to respond. And I think we can see some evidence so far that um, not in relation to water, but in relation to disability, for example, that village cash transfer fund is being accessed at a greater rate in rural areas. Um, so, you know, local governments and particularly, you know, down at that DESA level have much more potential to identify who is missing out on some of these national social protection measures and is able to really um, identify and be able to get that money out um, in form of cash transfers or you know, the other range of options. I think the potential for local governments to respond is actually um, quite, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good sign. Great, so our second question of the round was to all of the panelists from Yogi. Do we have anyone who'd like to jump in on that one? Um, I can jump in probably just uh, a little bit. Um, uh, so I think one of the challenge uh, is uh, our culture is that uh, most of Indonesia and probably think that uh, our life is in the hands of God. Uh, so I think that will be probably one of the challenge uh, adapting to a new culture, which is I think it's important to involve um, more uh like religious leaders in terms of uh addressing uh in terms of trying to re-engineer uh, basically uh, the whole culture to the new normal and another challenge for indonesia i think is in terms of the trust to the government um 
if we reflect both for the cases of Indonesia and also for the US, uh, and uh, there was actually a study, but I forgot uh, the title of uh, the paper. It was on, I think, on one of, uh, it, I think it was during SARS or swine flu, that shows that the trust uh, to the government can actually influence the the way people respond uh, to the direction from the government in terms of basic hygiene uh, and uh, that kind of stuff. So I think uh, we need to address it culturally, and also we need to improve uh, the way the gov uh, the way the government uh, talk with the people uh, in terms of uh, to become more like transparent, uh, to become more transparent. Um, that's all uh, I have. Uh, Pabudi probably want to add something. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, certainly, I uh, agree that um, what you have uh, mentioned. Uh, however, I also think that Indonesian are the same as any other uh, uh, peoples. Uh, uh, it quite varies. Uh, some of them are easy to adapt with the new uh, 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 rule and some are not. Uh, however, what I think should be important is that the government should be kind of firm in terms of what to do. And this, in a way, has been lacked, uh, like for Indonesia. Uh, so uh, some of the policies has been relatively letting uh, everybody do whatever they want, and that probably uh, uh, an issue. So uh, you cannot blame that people, some people are difficult or some people are easy, but what we could should and what we should uh, push is that the, we have a firm government in terms of dealing with this pandemic. And that will probably uh, has been a lack in Indonesia, in my opinion. Um, I might actually direct the third question, which was regarding um, what can more can be done to improve learning outcomes to you as well, um, Pak Budi, just noting your uh, focus on human capital development. Uh, okay, so uh, in improving learning outcome, there are uh, two sides that we need to think. One is the supply side of education, so that should be uh, a support and and that is why one of our recommendation is that the COVID stimulus should include uh, support uh, for education. Uh, so uh, a, a stimulus is a bit different than the usual government budget. So stimulus has two characteristics, one in terms of the size of the funding. Uh, so the size of the funding is spatial, it's usually bigger, and sacrifice uh, two things. One is we sacrifice because we have a higher deficit, meaning that most of the deficit has been funded by loans, so we actually uh, uh, borrowing for from future generation. And the second is that we are, are reallocate from other sector to this sector. The second characteristic of stimulus, why uh, education should be in a stimulus, is that stimulus has another characteristic in implementation. It should be fast, being fast, being implemented, and accurate, much more accurate than any usual budget. And that is the characteristic that has not been happening in the Indonesian stimulus. Some of the stimulus was relatively slow and not that accurate. So for example, uh, in the health system, uh, disbursement of health has been relatively slow. And, and we need to put that uh, component of education in that environment, which is you need to do it fast and accurate. And the other one is to support the uh, demand side of education, which is family. So they are actually being able to have their uh, children participate in this digital education. So uh, that is why the other support that needed is through uh, broadening or expand all this scholarship program in terms of the size of the scholarship, in terms of the coverage, and second also uh, uh, broadening uh, the some of the social assistance program that has been implemented uh, 
one of them could be uh, PKH, which is uh, uh, not only broadening up the coverage, but also uh, giving more extra funding for family that have children uh, still in school. So uh, that probably uh, uh, a thing that, uh, in a way, I was thought, I'm not talking about curriculum and so on, but that should be from the supply side uh, uh, support. Thank you. All right, thanks very much for that. Um, I'm conscious that there are quite a few more questions um, which we'd love to get to, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Um, so that ends our Q&A session. I'd just like to thank um, all of our speakers today and all of those who have sent in questions. Um, I think it's been a terrific session and um, we've really addressed the issue of, of health, human capital and gender. So I hope everybody um, who's joined us has, has found it um, as, as useful as I have. So I will um, hand over now to Professor Sullivan, who is going to uh, deliver our closing remarks, um, noting that this is the, the final session of the conference. Over to you, Professor Sullivan. Thank you so much. And um, thanks so much to all of you for participating over the last four days in uh, what I think has been a, an extraordinarily successful conference. Um, over the last four days, we've learned more about Indonesia's response to the crisis from an economic perspective. In particular, we've heard about the macro and microeconomic effects of COVID-19 in Indonesia and the short and long-term impacts. This conference represents the first comprehensive look at the economic of in, impact of COVID in Indonesia, um, and that is uh, of huge significance and importance. Other issues addressed, of course, um, food security and trade, poverty and vulnerable social groups, gender, fiscal mon and monetary policy and economic recovery, finance and the delivery of local public services, among many others. Um, all of those issues that are being discussed in many countries in many parts of the world. Um, it's always a privilege to be asked to either um, participate or uh, in some way in the Indonesia update and um, I'm always very grateful to do it. Um, but I know that all of this is as a result of an incredible amount of hard work uh, by a, a wide range of people. So um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers and the chairs uh, for doing such admirable work in, in pretty challenging circumstances. The conveners, particularly Blaine Lewis and Firma Mutola. The support staff and volunteers without whom none of this would happen. Kate, Lydia, Nuke, Dodi, Donny, Ruth, Ganaja, Juventus, Gala and Imed. DFAT for their continued support for the ANU Indonesia project and the ANU more broadly. ANU looks forward to extending and deepening the collaboration with DFAT at this incredibly challenging time for us all. And just for you to know that the proceeds of this, the proceedings of this event will be compiled into a book, which will be published by ISEAS early next year. A book based on the theme of last year's Indonesia update, Democracy in Indonesia, will be launched on the 23rd and 25th of September. And more details will be available on the Indonesia Project website. I do hope that you have all had a, a very productive and um, uh, if not uh, provocative time, uh, came in at the end of that discussion and it certainly seemed that you were um, engaging in some incredibly important um, issues. So thank you all for participating and um, I wish you all a safe journey home uh, wherever that might be. Thank you very much, Professor Sullivan. And so that concludes the Indonesia update for uh, this week. But thanks so much for joining us and uh, we look forward to another one. See you later, everybody.